you're going to turn your attention to Acts chapter 7. I'm going to read verses 44 through 51. And just to kind of reset the stage for you, uh, my goal is to do one sermon out of each of the chapters until the Lord changes that. We run out of chapters in Acts. There are 28 chapters. I don't know if it will go that long, but for now, that's where we're doing. And so, as I read through a chapter, picking out what it is that I want to cover, and obviously I can't cover the whole chapter, and, and what I do, uh, the, the way in which I primarily preach is called expository preaching, where everything, the structure of my message is coming from a particular passage. I don't just randomly do uh, pick things here and there, and, and that's perfectly fine, and it's called topical preaching, and I do that occasionally. But primarily, I do what's called expository preaching, and so I'm looking for the passage that I want, and I feel like God wants to use at that particular moment. And so I really wasn't sure where I was going and, uh, until I got to Acts chapter 7. I wasn't sure what I was going to preach out of there, but felt like the Lord gave me some clear direction. So Acts chapter 7, verses 44 through 51. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it, according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers in turn brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hands make all these things and then the next verse you stiff-necked people uncircumcised and heart and ears you always resist the holy spirit as your fathers did so do you now before you take that i'm preaching that last verse at you this is stephen getting ready to be stoned by the jewish leaders and he's preaching a message to them about the gospel and the fact that they've had the temple, they had the tabernacle, and they had the temple, but God is everywhere. And they have resisted the work that He is doing. When Jesus came on the scene, they resisted that. They put Him to death, and so He's saying, you have resisted the Holy Spirit. And so today, I want to preach for a little while on this thought. The house God lives in. The house God lives in. God bless you. You may be seated today. I moved a lot as a kid. I think at one time I counted up maybe some 12 or 13 different places that I lived before uh, I got married. In fact, when I was 16, we moved to, from Louisiana to Blue Springs, and I lived in the space of six years, lived in three different places in Blue Springs. We, we moved a whole lot and consequently went to a lot of different schools and a lot of different uh, places. Most of them in the same area, the same vicinity. We weren't moving, you know, across different states except for when I was 16. And uh, lived a little bit in Mississippi and then Louisiana. But, but even in, in that time of that 15 years or so that I was in Louisiana, I mean, we moved all over the place. And so consequently, there is no place that we look at that this is our family home. There's no place that we go back to, my, my siblings or even my parents, we go back to and say, well, this is the place where, where we came from, and this is our origin. In fact, most of my dad's family were from an area or a place called Bogalusa, Louisiana, and many of them have left the area, at least the people that I was connected with. And, and so there is no home place. There is no heritage, really, that drives us back to a, a, a homestead or a farm or a particular house that we grew up in. 
But there is innate in most people a desire to have a place to call home. That even if you travel a lot or if you move away, that there's something about this anchor called home that you can go back to. It's where your family is. It's where your parents are, your grandparents. It's where your siblings are. And something in most people, it seems, is they desire a place to call home. And I would ask you these questions. Does God have such a place? And does God desire a place to call His house or His home? And the answer to that that I will address in this, this message is that indeed God does have a desire and He has a place that He wants to call home. As I mentioned Stephen is standing before the people who are getting ready to kill him, one of which is Saul, who would later become the Apostle Paul. And he is standing by as at the next few verses after I, the text I read where, where Stephen is actually stoned to death, he's put to death, and Saul is standing there holding all of their coats to free them up to throw the stones. But he is preaching this message, and in his message he brings up Israel's history and he walks through that and he's very in their face uh, not the best way to win friends and influence people but maybe it, it's what we need to do at times when we're preaching the gospel is just say this is really what it is instead of beating around the bush and hoping that they'll get on board just say this is what it is and, and, and I can't tell you that that's always the way to do it it led to Stephen getting killed <laughs> but he preaches this message and he brings up the, ta- the tent in the wilderness or the tabernacle when he brings up the, ta- the uh, temple in Jerusalem and he brings up a number of other things. And so I-, I want to tell you there are five places that God has called home. The first is this, is God's house in the wilderness. His house in the wilderness, verse 44, 45, and 46, he says this, our fathers had a tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he who spake to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers in turn brought it with them in Joshua, and they brought it into the land of Canaan, which would become Israel. And so it was until the days of David. That God had a tent, as it's really what it is. We call it a tabernacle, but the Hebrew word is really it is a tent that God lived in, and if you understand this, a tent is a portable place to live in. You don't live in a tent all the time, it's a portable place, and and God had given Moses, when he's on the mountain, he had given him the directions to make the temple, or this tent, and he had had given him all of the the things about the furniture that needed to go in there, and and exactly how the dimensions should be, and, and how it should be covered, and what kind of wood, and very specific details about what it would look like and the Jews as they traveled through the wilderness for 40 years every time they would move they would pack up the tent and they would take it with them to the next place and then there they would set it up and they would offer sacrifice and they would worship God and then they would move to the next place and they would set it up and they would offer sacrifice and worship to God and they moved it over and over and finally when they came into the promised land Joshua brings it into the promised land. They set it up in a permanent place, but it's still just a tent. It's still just a portable building that they have used. It's covered with badger skins and certain kind of animal skins, and everything has to be just right. And in this, there is the brazen altar that's in the outward court of the tabernacle where they would offer the sacrifice, and then the brazen laver where they would come, and then the priest would wash after making the animal sacrifice. and Then they would go inside of the actual tabernacle in the wilderness, and there were three pieces of furniture that were inside there. It was the the menorah or the candlestick that would provide light in the the tabernacle, and then there was the altar of incense where they would offer the incense, and it would create this sweet aroma of worship to the Lord. And then there was the table of showbread that was, was there indicative of the fact that God provides. And that the priests would eat of that. They were the only ones allowed to eat of that. And, and then there was a separation in the tabernacle. 
where those last three things, the menorah, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense, where it's called the holy place. But there was another veil, and I've talked about this before, that separated that from this final piece of the tabernacle, which was called the holy of holies. And inside the tabernacle was the ark of the covenant. It was the ark symbolizing the covenant that God had made with them, and it consisted of a chest made of acacia wood. It was about four feet long by two and a half feet wide, roughly. It was overlaid with gold inside and out. It wasn't solid gold, but it, had, it was wood that was overlaid with gold. On the top was a lid that was made of pure gold, and it was referred to as the mercy seat. And over the mercy seat, there were two winged cherubim, or angels. They were made of hammered gold, and there were one on each end of the Ark of the Covenant. And the Bible says that the presence of God rested on the Ark between the two cherubims, which was why it was referred to as the throne of God. And inside the Ark of the Covenant were the Ten Commandments that Moses had received. It was the second set of Ten Commandments. He had broken the first one. Inside that was also Aaron's rod that budded, signifying God's supernatural power. And inside of that was a pot of manna, signifying God's provision. And the priest, every year, once a year, would come in and bring blood from the sacrifice. And the high priest was the only one allowed to go in, and every year, once a year, he would go in and he would pour blood on the mercy seat. And the Bible says that when he would do that, that the glory of God would fill the holy of holies. It was the place that God dwelled. It was God's house in the wilderness. The layout, the dimensions, the covering, everything was just as God commanded. And everywhere the tabernacle or this tent went, God went as well. But there came a time where David said God needs a, a permanent house, and it became God's house in Jerusalem. Now, now, David wasn't allowed to actually build the temple because God told, said that he was a man who had shed too much blood. He is a warrior. He had been fighting for decades, and God said, you can't build my house. But Solomon, the text says in verse 47, it was Solomon who built the house for him. It was a permanent place of worship. And then the people had this desire to see this grand place, not this badger skin covered building over here to the side that, that was, was really old and maybe decrepit by then and the, the animal skins, maybe the fur had been coming off, but they wanted to build a grand place for God to dwell. And so they built this temple and when Solomon, who took seven years to build the temple, when they dedicated the temple in all of its grandeur and everything that, that he could make it, everything gold here, and there was a lot of gold and a lot of silver and all of these things that made it really stand out. None of that really mattered without the presence of God. But when Solomon dedicated the temple, the Bible says that the glory of God filled the house. That fire came from heaven and consumed the sacrifice and the glory of God filled the temple. It was God's house in Jerusalem. However, it lasted less than 500 years because Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came in and he destroyed the temple. Some 70 years later, rebuilt by Ezra and Zerubbabel, Enhanced greatly by Herod the Great, who liked to build things and show off his architectural genius and to show off how much money he had. And so he enhanced greatly the building of that second temple just before Jesus came back or came the first time he enhanced that. But then in AD 70, that house in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman general Titus as he tore down the temple and as Jesus had prophesied not one stone was left upon another 
And to this day, the Jews are waiting to build their third temple. And if you read and understand end time prophecy, they, they will build their third temple. It will play a major role in end time prophecy. And when they get approval to make that third temple, you'll know that the coming of Jesus is soon to follow. It was God's house in Jerusalem, but but Stephen said, you can't really build a place with human hands. You can't, you can't take and build something because God is really everywhere. God has a house that is everywhere. The heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. He is everywhere, present at the same time. You can't contain the God of the universe. You can't build him a house. Stephen said it this way, Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my home, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? The, the things you're using to build this temple, the gold, the silver, the precious stones, all of that, God says, I made all of that. How can you build me a place for me to dwell in? I dwell everywhere. I've mentioned it earlier. God is omnipresent. That means he's everywhere present. He's all present that wherever you are, God is there. And wherever I am, God is there. And the psalmist would say in Psalm 139, if I make my bed in hell, behold, he's even there. He is, he is in the depths of the earth. He's in the depths of the sea. No matter where can I go, wherever I go, he's there. Where can I flee from his presence? God is everywhere. So you can't contain him. You can't build him a house. The fourth place that God dwelt, it's not in the text, but I wanted to bring it out anyway, and that is... God's house with us. Specifically referring to Jesus who is Emmanuel, God with us. Matthew 1, 23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. That when Jesus Christ was walking the earth, it was God with us. It wasn't just God everywhere. It wasn't God in a tabernacle. It wasn't God in a temple. But it was God in a human body walking around with us. Everywhere Jesus went, it was God. In fact, John 1.14 uses that same word referring to the tabernacle in the wilderness. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the Greek actually means he tabernacled or tented with us. Just like that Old Testament tabernacle that God came in the form of Jesus Christ, we have seen His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He tabernacled with us. But that was all past the fifth house is the most important today and that is this it is God's house in us that Stephen accused his listeners of being stiff-necked and resisting the Holy Spirit that Holy Spirit that had been prophesied and promised by Jesus that Holy Spirit that that Jesus had said was going to come Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose shoes or sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus would say in John 7.39, or it would be said of, of what he had just spoken, but he that this he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus talking to his disciples in John 14, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be 
in you. That Jesus said, I'm here dwelling with you, but there is another comfort that when I go, the Spirit is coming and it's going to dwell in you. That it is my Spirit that is coming to dwell. The same Spirit, I'm dwelling with you now, but I'm going to dwell in you later. John 15, 26, another promise by Jesus. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. John 16, 7, nevertheless I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Acts 1.8, Jesus said, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and he shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And to make this point, the Apostle Paul, in his, in his letters, in his first letter to the Corinthians, would say, but you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. In chapter 3, he said that of the church corporately, that all who are filled with the Spirit, that corporately they are, that's the church, they are the temple of the Holy Ghost. But chapter 6, he would say it of us individually, but individually we are temples of the Holy Ghost. It is God's house in us, that when we're filled with the Spirit, God is living in us. He is tabernacling, or he is now, our bodies have become the temple of the Spirit. He is living in this house. Anybody thankful that the Spirit of God is living inside of you? That God is tabernacled or tented inside of us? Would you give Him praise for that? But you you may not be aware of this. But there are many who deny or resist the Spirit. Many who call themselves Christians they push the Spirit aside. They might reference the Spirit, but they don't want the Spirit like it happened in the book of Acts and like it should happen to us today. I was looking on a a church website a couple of weeks ago. I was doing a Bible study and something had come up in in that Bible study and one of the people attend what was a daughter work or daughter church of this church that I'm reading. I'm going to read you an excerpt from their website. But one of the two people in the Bible study attend a church that has the same beliefs. I couldn't find what I was looking for on the, the local church here in town, so I went back to the mother church. I'll leave it nameless. But they have a statement. It's three paragraphs long. I'm going to read you paragraphs one and three. Blank is a non-charismatic, conservative, evangelical fellowship that welcomes all who know Jesus Christ as their Savior and all who are seeking Him. Those who claim to possess the gift of tongues and other sign gifts are welcome to worship and fellowship with us if they are willing to be a source of unity rather than division in our church body. We believe that the Christian life is supernatural and that the Lord continues to perform miracles. We also believe that current displays of the gift of tongues distracts from the main task of the local church. You can come. We just don't want you to speak in tongues. We don't want to see these sign gifts. And if you're not familiar with the sign gifts, they're found in 1 Corinthians 12, tongues, they're the gift of tongues, not the, gift, not the sign of the gift of the Spirit, but the gifts that come after you're filled with the Spirit, tongues and interpretation of tongues and prophecy and word of wisdom and word of knowledge and miracles and healings and faith. Oh, we believe God performs healings, we just don't want you to do it here. We believe God performs miracles, we just don't want to see that here. We believe that God may give people the gift of tongues, but we just don't want to see that here. Paragraph 3, 
this church seeks to prevent the propagations of doctrines that would cause divisions within an individual church. Therefore, members of an inheritance of blank are not to propagate the teachings and emphasis of the current charismatic movement. Although we do not control personal individual interactions with the Lord, the expression of tongues and other sign gifts are not to be over, overtly expressed at meetings that are under the organization and authority of said church. You can do what you want, just don't do it here. There are those that resist the Spirit. I would liken them to what Stephen said to his first century audience. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised and hard in ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. We believe it exists. We just don't want to see it. We don't want to experience and you can't do it. I would tell you that every New Testament follower of Jesus from Acts chapter 2 forward was filled with with the Holy Spirit. And while the text does not tell us every instance, the evidence would seem clear that not only were they all filled with the Spirit, but they all spoke with other tongues. It was the expected norm. It wasn't just that descriptive Part, but it was a prescriptive part of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8, and I'll preach from Acts chapter 8 next week. It doesn't actually mention tongues, but it's really clear that there was an external outward sign that was there signifying they had been filled with the Spirit. But I would tell you this truth, that a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. That those of you who have experienced the infilling of the Holy Spirit, you're never at the mercy of a person that just has an argument. Because nothing can take away your experience. Nothing can tell you that what you have experienced isn't true. Nothing can tell you that what you have experienced isn't real. The apostles all spoke with tongues. Peter and James and John and Matthew and Levi. Thomas, the doubter. Even Mary, the mother of Jesus, she was there that first day in Acts chapter 2. She and 119 others, the Spirit came. And God made his house and a person. They spoke with tongues, and, and I speak with tongues. And many of you do as well. So you can't tell me that when I read the Bible and I have this experience that it's not true and it doesn't exist and it's not for today. Because when God moved in to this house, I spoke tongues so how do you know God has moved into your house the broader Christian world would just say trust me when I tell you that he's there I didn't experience anything nothing happened oh just believe me when I tell you he's there some would say well, we'll wait a few years and then you'll have some fruit and then we'll know. But 
if I can say, you don't have to take anyone's word for it. You don't have to trust me. You don't have to wait for five or six or 20 years to have fruit of the Spirit develop in your life. What I would tell you is when God moves in, everyone around you will know. There's no question. There's no, I wonder if God moved into that house today. You'll know. Would you stand together with me? God had a house in the wilderness. He had a house in Jerusalem. Ultimately, He is everywhere, and He was God's house with us in the form of Jesus Christ. But today, while He's still everywhere present, He is God's house in us. Some would ask this question or make this assertion. In fact, this same church website I was on they spent paragraph after paragraph after paragraph trying to convince the reader that they actually had the Spirit. In fact, they would say on this website, once God's house, if I can say it this way, always God's house. Spent a lot of time talking about that on their website. I mentioned the Ark of the Covenant earlier, and it represented the presence of God to the people. But for some 20 years after the Ark of the Covenant was carried into battle, and that's a whole other sermon in itself, but it was carried into battle and it was captured by the Philistines. For some 20 years, the Ark of the Covenant that represented the presence of God wasn't in the tabernacle, Shiloh. It wasn't there. It, it wasn't in the Holy of Holies. And yet every day, the priests, knowing it's not in the Holy of Holies, they'd make their sacrifice at the altar and then they would go to the labor and they would go into the holy place and they would do their duties and I don't know if once a year they still went into the holy of holies and where no ark was they took the blood and they just poured it on the ground because the ark isn't there faking the people out saying God is still here but the sign of his presence is in the hand of the Philistines They got it back. The Bible says that when the Babylonians came in and destroyed the temple that Solomon built in 586, there are four passages of Scripture that describe the things that they took from the, the temple and they carried off into Babylon. And in none of the four passages is the Ark of the Covenant ever mentioned. Some would say that sometime after Josiah in 620 B.C. that Josiah placed the Ark of the Covenant back in the temple. It had been taken out of the temple and King Manasseh had set up idols in place of the Ark of the Covenant. That the sign and the symbol of God's presence once again had been vacated from the temple. And false gods were worshipped in the temple and Josiah put it back in there. That's the last time it's mentioned. And the reality is that we don't know what happened to it. Nobody knows, which is why you get movies like Indiana Jones and The Lost Ark. Following a particular 
theory or hypothesis that the ark went to Egypt. We don't know. But what seems clear is this, that when they rebuilt the tabernacle, or rebuilt the temple, they rebuilt it without the ark. So for almost 500 years, the temple that Jesus would have gone to Ark was probably absent. When Titus destroyed the temple in 70 AD, he said, what's the big deal? What's the fuss? Because it's empty. There's no ark there. So I say all of that, say, it's real easy for people to pretend people to go through the motions but Jude 12 would tell us this there are people who are like clouds without water they look the part they act the part as you know a cloud is only a cloud because it's got water vapor in it. it's only a cloud because it's going to rain at some point But Jude would say there are these people who are saying they're Christians, but they're clouds without water. Second Timothy, Paul would write, have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. From such people turn away. to be filled with the Spirit. I want to be God's house individually. I want us to be God's house corporately. And it is His desire that He is God's house in us. If that's your desire, would you raise your hands where you are? Would you just talk to Him? Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your presence and your power, Lord. Thank you for your presence and your power. Thank you that you have tabernacled with us, that you've taken up residence in us, Lord. We don't have to wonder, Lord, if you're here, but but there is a clear sign and a clear sound, Lord, that when you moved in, and we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you have taking residence in us. Lord, we give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise.